Welcome to Your Work Week with St. Luke's and our new sermon series, Living Our Stories. For this episode of our podcast, Dr. Eric Moore is joining us. Dr. Moore is a postdoctorate fellow working with Candler School of Theology at Emory University, and his expertise is in the book of Luke and Acts. Tonight, he will be joining us as we begin to lead our lives together and look at the story of Acts and how Christ called us to be witnesses in the world. The passage we are looking at today comes at the beginning of Acts and is thus very significant in the narrative as part of the overall story of the church. In fact, one way to describe Acts as a narrative is to liken it to an origin story or a story of beginnings. So this chunk would be the origin of the origin story or the overall story that Luke is trying to tell. In its cultural context, these types of stories, origin stories, were common. Um, But whereas many of those recounted the beginnings of a city or uh, some other type of civic community, Acts depicts the origin of the Jesus followers as a group, as a church. But the church for Luke does not exist on its own. It is part of the story of Jesus, who himself is part of God's story. And given this, one would expect to find parallels between Luke's account of Jesus in his gospel and the story of the church in Acts. And guess what? There are plenty of such parallels. Words, themes, character types, historical sensibilities that find their way into both aspects or both dimensions of this two-volume story. In fact, because of these parallels, some have likened Acts to another type of genre, biography. Now, biographies were common in the ancient world, and they betrayed uh, luminary figures such as philosopher, for example, and his followers, those who would carry on the mantle. A prominent theme in these stories is the degree to which these followers imitate the master. And this is a helpful lens for looking at Luke Acts. The passage in Acts that we are looking at, in fact, establishes the calling of the church and its leaders to be public witnesses to the resurrection and gospel of Jesus. There is in Acts a movement from the ministry of Jesus towards the collective ministry of his representatives in the world. This collective emphasis will be especially prominent in next week's study, but we see it here already. The believers come together, 1-6. All were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together, Acts 1-14. Peter stood up among the believers, Acts 1.15. And then also the appointment of Judas' successor is similar, for it is to take his place in the ministry of an apostleship, so part of this larger body of 12 witnesses to Jesus. Of course, Luke focuses on the work of the apostles and Paul, but arguably he intends for their life to be exemplary. They model for believers' attitudes or dispositions as well as actions. And our author links their missional story of ministry to that of the Lord while making subtle shifts in emphasis um, to what they will accomplish on behalf of the establishment of the church. In what follows, I will illustrate this connection between Jesus and his followers ministry in two sections, the prologue and the ascension story of Jesus, and then come back to Acts 1, 6 through 8, to reflect on the nature of the apostles' mandate to be witnesses and what implications that has for the church. So looking at the prefaces, Luke's prefaces both here and in his gospel are unique in the New Testament, but they are hardly unprecedented in ancient literature and have drawn comparisons to the opening sections of historical and medical works of the time. Whatever the best comparison, Luke's prefaces signal self-awareness and intentionality. He is writing for a certain Theophilus, but just as much for posterity, for all those who would self-identify as a lover of God. The two prefaces are bound together by an emphasis on Jesus. In the Gospel preface, Luke signals his desire to produce an orderly account so that Theophilus may know the truth most certainly the truth about the life and death death and resurrection of Jesus. The preface of Acts picks up this thread, referencing how in the first book the author wrote about all that, quote, Jesus did and taught, end quote, from the beginning until being taken up into heaven, 
uh, 1 2. By so doing, Luke is adopting Jesus' ministry as a framework for the story he will now, now tell about the church. This new purpose is signaled by a shift in emphasis to the church's leaders, the apostles. Luke makes it a point here in chapter 1 of Acts to reference the, quote, instructions Jesus gave to the apostles whom he had chosen. He may be referring to the entire period of discipleship depicted in the Gospels, in which case Luke is valorizing that as a preparation for ministry of their own, in other words, taking up the mantle of Jesus. Or Luke may be alluding more specifically to the post-resurrection instruction that we find in Luke chapter 24, the end of the Gospel, beginning with Jesus' appearance to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and followed by his resurrection appearances to all the disciples except for Judas. There are some points of overlap between Luke 24 and what the preface here concisely notes. These include references to Jesus' suffering and his presentation of proof to the disciples, which could include his showing of his hands and his feet to them, as well as his interpretation of the scriptures as ultimately proving, quote, that the Messiah is to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, Luke 24, 45. Moreover, in noting how Jesus was speaking to the, to the disciples about the kingdom of God, Acts 1, 3, he may have in view either the body of instruction in Luke's gospel as a whole, or, once again, the specific teaching about the Messiah's death and resurrection and the consequent repentance and forgiveness that was to be preached to the nations beginning in Jerusalem. That is mentioned in Jesus' last meeting with the disciples in Luke 24. Nevertheless, though there is continuity between the preface in Acts chapter 1 and Luke chapter 24, there are some subtle and not so subtle differences that serve to advance the narrative in the direction of the church's ministry through the apostles. The first of these is Luke's important note here in Acts that there was a 40-day period between Jesus' resurrection as, and his ascension. This is a biblically symbolic period of time which serves to underscore the divine authority that underpins the forthcoming mission of the church. During this time, Jesus prepares the apostles by equipping them with a fuller understanding of the kingdom of God. And in the gospel, this concept, the kingdom of God, was firmly associated with Jesus' ministry. The implication here is that the apostles' ministry, the ministry of the church, will be a continuation or firmly associated with Jesus' ministry, an expansion of that ministry, if you will, even. The second shift relates to how post-resurrection ministry is described. In Luke 24, there is more of a passive formulation of the ministry. Jesus there alludes to the scripture to show that, quote, repentance and forgiveness of sin is to be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. And the disciples are there descri then described as, quote, witnesses of these things, upon whom Jesus will send, quote, what my father promised, and because of which they must, quote, stay in the city until they have been clothed with power, Luke 24, 49. The preface in Acts, however, foregrounds the command to stay in Jerusalem, closely followed by the promise of the Holy Spirit. Incidentally, as an aside, Luke here likens reception of the Holy Spirit to baptism, which recalls Jesus' own reception of the Holy Spirit at his baptism. This again helps to underscore how the story of the apostles' ministry is in important ways a continuation of Jesus's. At any rate, the actual mandate in Acts chapter 1, 6 through 8, to which we'll return, then states the apostles' participation in more active terms opposed to the passive terms in Luke 24. The apostles will, quote, receive power, quote, you will be my witnesses, not just of these things as in Acts 24, but as active conduits to the world as part of Jesus' mission articulated in Acts chapter 1, 6 through 8. Let's turn to the ascension and look at the kind of connections there that we see to Jesus' ministry and the apostles' mission. Jesus' ascension is indeed another place where we do see this continuity yet shift in emphasis. To begin with, both Luke 24 and Acts 1 describe Jesus being raised up to heaven. 
There is, however, a heightening of the divine dimension of this ascension in Acts, which includes a cloud taking Jesus out of sight, Acts 1.9, and a reference to two men in white clothes, white robes, Acts 1.10. And these two men in white robes probably recall the two men in dazzling clothes at Jesus' tomb in Luke's resurrection account. But there is a more significant uh, difference here in the ascension account in Acts. This relates to the way Luke does or does not demarcate Jesus' last words and the ascension. Luke specifically notes that Jesus was, quote, lifted up following these instructions to link the instruction in 1, 6 through 8 to the ascension of Jesus in verses 9 through 10. This gives the impression that the two are very closely intertwined. This is in contrast to the depiction in, in the gospel where Jesus is said to have been blessing the disciples as, as he ascended. And Luke was certainly not ignorant of these differences. The point here is not one of historical accuracy, but rather theological emphasis. What Luke wishes to stress here in Acts is that the ministry of the apostles, and by extension the church, is linked to the ministry of Jesus and his authority which is certified by his resurrection and exaltation. Another aside, Peter will riff on the importance of Jesus' exaltation for the ministry of the Spirit in Acts 2, 3, 32, but we'll have to wait for this until next week. Back to our text, the link between the story of Jesus and the church is emphasized further by the angel's promise of Jesus' return here at the end of the Ascension account. So, in other words, both the prologue and the ascension accounts across Luke and Acts communicate a shift in emphasis to the ministry of the apostles and thus the church, but they do so in a way that firmly situates the work of the apostles and the church in the ministry of Jesus. Now, let us take a look at the mandate itself in Acts 1, 6 through 8 and consider its implications for the church, for all of us, really. Therefore, in verse 6, it signals a connection with the report of Jesus' post-resurrection activities above in verses 3 through 5. In particular, his triumph, command to remain in Jerusalem, and promise of the Spirit, again recalling Jesus' own baptism, leads the apostles to expect something momentous. This heightened expectation sets up their question, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Acts 1.6 this concern was not new, in fact. On the way to Emmaus, two of Jesus' followers, not knowing that they were speaking to the risen Lord, had confessed their shattered hope that Jesus, quote, was the one to redeem Israel, Luke 24, 21. But new or not, the answer that the apostles receive here in Acts 1 is surely unexpected. Now, to zoom out a bit, there is a venerable tradition in antiquity of mortals asking something of a deity and receiving an unexpected answer. For example, at the beginning of this left lesson, I offered the comparison between acts and stories about the origin of cities and civic communities more broadly. And here's one more facet of that analogy. Many of those other stories begin with a human approaching a god with a question about some particular problem, childlessness, physical malady, social unrest, etc only to be commanded in response that they must go out and found a city, completely out of left field. In the Hebrew Bible, of course, we have something similar, more biblically, of unexpected mandates. And this we see in the prophetic calls in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. Okay, the individual does not seek, but yet receives a unique mandate to be God's instrument and or mouthpiece of justice. Returning to our text, Acts 1, 6 through 8 communicates the surprising mandate, nature of the mandate, and that hinges on the expectation that Jesus' resurrection would reestablish the kingdom of Israel, probably at least in part as a political entity. There are then two ways to read Jesus' response. One holds that Jesus flat out rebuffs the apostles, essentially informing them that their hopes are misplaced, their priorities misaligned. They are concerned with provincial matters when they should be looking at the bigger picture, God's plan for the nations. But the other reading maintains that Jesus rather reorients the disciples' hopes rather than denying them out of hand. 
Jesus too, after all, is concerned with the salvation of Israel. The surprising nature of his response has rather to do with how that redemption is going to be accomplished instead of revolving around a radically different set of concerns. This interpretation seems more felicitous to me. After all, throughout his two-volume work, Luke shows a pronounced interest in Jerusalem. A large portion of the gospel is structured to emphasize the march of Jesus' ministry towards the holy city. And the narrative of Acts begins and frequently circles back to Jerusalem. An implication here is that whatever the newness of Jesus' mandate, in fundamental ways it represents a continuation of God's story of faithfulness to and ministry through his people, the Jews. Nevertheless, Jesus' response to the disciples' query illustrates the surprising and boundless ways in which God works to accomplish his mission. And this, the unfathomable mind of God, is something that was emphasized by Jesus in the preceding verse, where he says, rather bluntly, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, Acts chapter 1-7. Yet while the message counsels humility, the strong but, Allah in Greek, that follows at the beginning of verse 8, implicitly commends the apostles' interest while setting the stage for the surprising missional mandate. But you will receive power when the Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses to Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The first thing that is surprising here is the apostles' foregrounded participation in Jesus' mission. They had asked about Jesus acting to restore the kingdom, but are instead informed of their own activities on his behalf as his witnesses. Importantly, though, they will not be acting alone. The missional work as witnesses will be empowered by the same Holy Spirit that accompanied Jesus in his mission. Their story is part of his story the story of God redeeming his people and working through and beyond them to redeem the world. But here precisely is the next surprising part of the mandate, its scope. It is not, of course, surprising that Jesus would want the apostles to act as his witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, but in Samaria and to the end of the earth. Many have observed that Jesus' oracle here functions as a blueprint or better yet itinerary for the entire Acts narrative. The first seven chapters up to the stoning of Stephen relate the apostolic ministry in Jerusalem and Judea. Chapter 8 narrates ministry in Samaria, and the remainder concerns the proclamation about Jesus throughout the wider Mediterranean world. Of course, this assumes a Jerusalem-centric view of the world. The Roman view of the world would put places like Judea at the margins. Thus, Luke and other Jewish views of the centrality of Jerusalem effectively reconfigure the dominant perspective. Now, readers and hearers of Luke's gospel, many of whom were beneficiaries of this wider ministry that is now being articulated, would already have picked up on the universal emphasis in Luke's gospel. But those readers, like we, are the external audience. For the internal audience, those in the narrative, Jesus' mandate is strikingly open-ended in its scope. It demands a reframing of the kingdom of God, kingdom of Israel, excuse me, as the kingdom of God, established by the Holy Spirit through the Lord and the apostles as his witnesses, and embracing people near and far, both Jews as Jews and Gentiles as Gentiles. In conclusion, one lesson for those of us seeking to lead our lives as witnesses. As we look at this passage, Acts 1, uh, in its entirety, is that as public theologians, our calling more often than not is surprising in nature and expansive in scope, but in fundamental ways, it represents a continuation of the story of God in Jesus. Welcome to Your Week with St. Luke's and our Office Hour podcast. My name is Pastor Jen, and each week during this sermon series, we're going to be talking about our stories. So we've talked about my stories and our individual stories, um, and now we're going to be talking about putting all of our individual stories together to be a St. Luke story. And we're going to do that using the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1 through 5, and seeing how the early church really 
we're able to learn, live, love, and lead together. Um, and we're going to start this week with lead. Now, each week I'm going to have in the office hour podcast an interview with clergy, staff, and St. Lucas. Um, but today we're really going to kind of start with the end in mind of what it means to lead our lives like Jesus. After we've learned the story, after we've lived together in community here at St. Luke's, after we've loved God in worship, then we're supposed to go out and be public theologians. And that's why I have three St. Lucas with me today that I'm so excited to talk to. We've got Cynthia Kahn, who is a longtime St. Lucas involved in many different areas of the church. Well, all of you are, so I'm going to let you tell your story. We've got Dick Batchelor and Angie Wynn. So I'm going to let you all introduce yourselves by asking you how long you've been here at St. Luke's and a little bit about yourself, not just in St. Luke's, but more importantly, outside of St. Luke's, your role. So Cynthia, let's start with you. Right. My most important accomplishment is my husband, David Rimpo, and he has oh. been an incredible wingman through all of the missions, things that we've done. Um, I have been a member of St. Luke's for over 10 years, but a much longer um, attendee of St. Luke's. Actually, before I even moved to Florida, uh, I would, when I visited, I came to St. Luke's. So it's been a relationship that goes back into the 90s. Um, I retired in the midst of a pandemic, wasn't sure if it was a good or bad idea, but it was destined to happen uh, after 32 years in, in the practice of law. So um, as a result, we were quiet for a while, and then as opportunities popped up for missions, um, I've done Coalition for the Homeless for probably 10 years, got involved with the food distribution, got involved with cleaning, I'm involved with the farm and do a lot of volunteer work hosting people on Sundays and other things that pop up here at St. Luke's. Great, thank you. How about you, Dick? Oh, well, obviously I'm the oldest one, so I, <laughs> <laughs> my wife and I joined this uh, church, started to go to the church in 1983 when we got engaged. And so back before Jim Harnish started, in a, I think, a fire station at a Chinese restaurant, right. whenever he started the church from, when this was just a, a big dream, this whole campus. Mm -hmm. So I've been involved in the church for a long time. And as has Andrea, as you well know, she leads a Bible study, and so she's been intimately involved in it too. And I very much enjoyed the family relationship here over the, over the years. And uh, on the outside world, I'm, uh, I'm a professional beggar, actually. I've been involved <laughs> in uh, so many not-for-profit organizations, uh, Everything from domestic violence to child abuse, homeless issues, opioid project. So that's the way I try to give back. And as a quote recently said, I lead with my heart. So I guess I lead with my heart and try to, you know, learn, or take what I've learned and, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the church and really, like you said, the teaching of Jesus, how do you now go forward and try to do things that, uh, that are meaningful? So I'm um, heavily involved in a not-for-profit sector. That's great. Thank you. How about you, Angie? Um, Angie Wynn. And we started coming here in 1997, and my husband was like, we won't join a church. I don't, I don't believe in established religion. We can show up. And then I was out one day, came back home, and he said, well, David Stevens called, and we're joining the church. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that wasn't very hard, was it? So, yeah, we've been around a long time, and we've raised our boys here and um, been involved in missions, and he's been doing finance over the years and just various different places. Um, used to sing. He played drums. And in the outside world, um, it's kind of, it feels like it's all kind of one, right? Mm -hmm. I started my background as leadership and organizational development, and I was in the corporate world for a long time, and then through a crazy lightning bolt experience, ended up in the nonprofit world, um, and then helping leaders not burn out, working in community development, inner city ministry, and then I burnt out. And so five years later, I find myself actually really learning tools of ways to receive God's love, I guess you could say, um, through body, mind, heart, and spirit. And so instead of just, let's analyze God from our brains, but like how can we release things in our body and how can we quiet our minds and more contemplative practices and stillness and silence. And so now I support leaders and the community through things like yoga, mindfulness, meditation, retreats, and things like that. So, 
So you each talked about the beauty of what we're trying to accomplish here with when you learn, live, and love and, and do that sort of in the context of the church, of the community of the church, it's all to support you going out and leading your life and, and being public theologians. You, you all are the theologians. You all are the ones that talk about God and talk about God's story through the, your actions in your everyday life. So, so what does it mean for you to lead your life like Jesus would? What, is there a difference in understanding leading your life like you would versus leading your life like Jesus would? Well, I've been thinking about this question, and it's a hard question, because I feel like, um, in a way, as my life has evolved, there's not a daily choice. I don't make a choice, okay, Jesus, am I going to lead lead with you in charge or am I going to let the world be in charge? It mm. feels like there's this, the more that I say yes to opportunities and to a leading and the more that I'm quiet and I discern this place in me that is connected to God, then the more expansive and beautiful and fruitful my life is. Um, so I would say that there's always this tendency in me to to strive, right? To go, 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 to um, go out there and conquer and be something important and extraordinary. And so that is what I trip up on, right? Okay. Instead of being quiet and listening, okay, what is it that, um, what could my life look like right in this moment, being present and loving and trying to really be fully about who God has designed me to be? That's great, sense. right? Because I think a lot of times we, like I used the word bifurcation in the last podcast. We we know there's the there's the church, there's the Sunday me, and then there's the rest of me. And you're talking about the integration yeah. and that that one informs the other. That's that's exactly what we mean um, in this. What about for you all? The time that I've spent at St. Luke's is probably the most intense time that I've had the privilege of learning um, more about the Bible, more about faith. And the more I've learned through book study, sermons, Bible study, shalom, especially the pilot shalom that we did, it was about listening, not listening to speak, but listening for the sake of listening. Um, the more I've learned, the more I've loved. And the more you love, the more you want to live a life where you don't sit at the center of the story. And I like to meet people where they are. Um, I like to know about them, hear their stories, and I want to walk beside them. And that means I need to be a good steward of my resources. I'm retired, so it's no longer money. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. so what other resources do I have? I have time. I have abilities. And I try to use those in a way um, that is a Christ-centered life. Use the word bifurcate. I'm going to use it again because when you ask the question about do you lead your life like Jesus would, that's impossible, you know. Right, right. But can you leave your life like Jesus' teachings? Yes. I, mean, I can. I can try that, right? Now, God's job is to get me out of the ditch on a regular basis. So, you know, <laughs> I'm in the ditch. I'm out of the ditch. Give me in a ditch again. And so I will. I will share with you too uh, one thing uh, that you asked earlier. I think that people can relate to. A lot of people in this church can relate to. Is I grew up Southern Baptist. My mother, my wife grew up as a Catholic, so we became Methodist. <laughs> she goes, "I'm not going to be Baptist." I go, "Well, I'm not going to be Catholic." So we became Methodist, right? And um, and and it was really the Methodist teachings in this church that when I began to hear the gospel as it should be taught, in my opinion. Because I reflect back on some of the teachings growing up in the Southern Baptist Church and the pounding, the ham fisting of the pulpit and the pulpit and that kind of thing, and all the, you know, the guilt and the wildly misinterpreted uh, view of the Bible, in my in my opinion. So I think I learned in the Methodist tradition, if I might use that term, in the teachings of the Methodist Church, really about how do you really try to apply what you've learned about the teachings of Jesus to try to replicate those in your life somehow. So, but it really became in the Methodist Church where the, the instructions are so intentional and specific and, and, and applicable. You can really do something with it. You don't have to go out in the world 
angry with your religion, right? Right. You know, right. You, you can't, that's not what you do. You're not out there to chastise and judge people. You're right. out there to be meet them where they are, listen to them, let them become, have a confidence level in you, and then you can, you can again, try to live out the teachings of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. How do you think that those teachings, Dick, Dick and all of you, has shaped your work, um, made you think about the world and what you do, your work, differently? Well, not in the not-for-profit side, again, in the voluntary work, it, it's really, I always say as an advocate, put a face on it. Right. And really, maybe I could amend that lesson to you this morning and basically put a, put a heart on it mm-hmm. after you put a face on it, right? And so how do you engage with somebody and go meet them where they are and understand their challenge? If it's domestic violence or child abuse or homeless or whatever opioid crisis, whatever the issue might be, the church is involved in so many of those issues. But how do you meet them where they are, engage them, get a confidence level where they will listen to what you say, you know, become a part of their relationship, put a face on it, but then how do you then put a heart to the face, and then so I guess that's what it is. Like, kind of sequential, I suppose, but it comes all in one. Well, in in and so reflective of the gospel. Again, that's so reflective of what Jesus did was was to go in and meet people where they're at, and and hear hear who they were, and then put put a face and a heart on it. Mm. So whether it was healing the paralytic, this was a face that people weren't looking at, and Jesus went and touched them. A leper, people weren't looking and seeing the faces of them and Jesus touched them and healed them and put God's heart on it and could put God's story on it. So in essence, that's exactly what you're talking about is living the gospel out loud through your nonprofit work, 100%. Yeah. And I would say at the beginning of my um, journey, right, it was such a stirring for the marginalized, a heart, heart for the poor. And so that through this jury duty experience I had, like that changed the whole trajectory of my life, right? Starting to work in the nonprofit realm with marginalized communities. Um, But then that that other piece is meeting people where they are. And I think that's so important. This overwhelming sense of abundance and love and generosity Mm -hmm. um, that that we experience, you know, when we encounter Jesus and, and I feel like my passion now is to help remove obstacles between people and their view of God and of Jesus. So right. the structures and systems that people put in place, like mm-hmm. religions, right? Um, but also those internal obstacles that keep people from not feeling worthy and not feeling able to receive what God has, the love for them. Yeah. And so doing that through yoga and training, you're just meeting people who probably come for a yoga class and instead they get this spiritual opportunity or come for training from you, like, like training in HR and the things you do with leadership. And what they receive though, is the story of God. And you don't even mention God sometimes. It's really powerful. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think people know when they engage with some of you that they're going to receive the story of Jesus. Um, But they do through your actions. And what difference has that made for people? Do you think? I think it makes a huge difference. For me, love is a verb. It means do. You've got to do. Um, It's interesting because you can sit at home and it's safe and you can think, um, I'm not hurting anybody, but I think there's more to it than that. There are so many ways that you can take that next step and you can help. You don't have to fix everything. You can't fix everything. But if you take your steps... You may touch and inspire somebody and you create a ripple of hope that extends. And I think just the training and what we do here um, has really changed the entire lens through which I view everything Mm -hmm. and just listening and learning and being a person in somebody's life. Again, maybe not preaching you know, with your fist, (laughs) but preaching through love. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting because when we were talking about these four words, it was about, um, we talked about what it meant to go out and to serve. And we really have always used the word serve. Serve in missions is incredibly important to St. Luke's. But we chose the word lead. 
um, because I think people don't see themselves as leaders of their lives mm-hmm. and leaders in their world sometimes. You all are leaders in, by, by the fact of what you've done with your life. But to lead as a disciple and to lead as a theologian, um, uh, what do you think that word means? If, if that's an expectation of what it means to be a part of St. Luke's is to go out and lead your life um, as a student. What do you think the weight of that word means to lead or to be a leader of faith? Well, I think it's extremely intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably I, true, yeah, right? Yeah. It's, it's lifting the expectation of yeah. people. And I think people would hide, will hide. You know, I mean, I've done it a lot where I'm, I am not equipped to go and do this ever, what I'm being called to do. Um, yet at the same time, like, I think it's Mark 10. I'm not good at remembering where these things are, but this, when Jesus sends out the 72 disciples, yes, right? Yes, right. And he says, don't bring your toolbox. Don't bring your extra tunic and your sandals. Just go. And that has been mm-hmm. so important for me because I have been in spaces where I need to pull up my training and all of that I've learned and make sure that that's what I'm presenting and I'm hiding behind that. And instead, God's saying, actually, I don't care about that. You might be pulling that in or not. I care about you being vulnerable, open, and who you are. Let people see how I have crashed into your very ordinary human condition. Yes. <laughs> and it yes. gives them hope that God will do the same. For yes. Them. Yes. I love that. And I think one of the things that's so timely about leadership, uh, however you define it and how you're trying to execute it, is now we live in a very caustic, divisive world, right? Yes. And people are yelling, what is the old saying? You're yelling so loud I can't hear a word you're saying. They're, they're talking past each other. And it's usually kind of caustic politics. So, but I think when you get down to this level, and we can find commonality, right? I mean, people want to help people who have opioid crisis. People want to help people who are homeless. People who want to help people, children who are being abused. So I think if we can, you know, get out of that toxic zone and get down where we're really talking and mentoring and witnessing and i think it's just a, a, a much it's a much for much for much more fertile ground i think for communications than it is at, at this level up here so I, I just think it's i think we have the perfect opportunity now to do what we try to do right. every day in the community because we can relate to people heart to heart face to face rather than, you know, something that's so caustic and right. up here, right? right. right. I'm with Angie. I don't feel like a leader. <laughs> <laughs> that's a slightly terrifying word. Um, um, but what I do love is just being able to say yes. Hmm. And I think, you know, as simple as just leading by example, right. just saying, I-, I will go in a field and I will pick food. I will glean food for people who don't mm. have it. I will just say yes. And uh, it, that's what leading means to me. Just saying yes to what's in front of you at the moment. That's a leader, by the way. Ooh. Oh, you know, <laughs> as intimidating as it might be. You're a leader. Yeah. And that's, that's actually what we want to evoke. This sense yeah. of when you've learned the story, when you've lived the story and practiced the story, you know, you've learned and, and you've you've learned your drills and skills, <laughs> kind of like an instrument, or you've learned your script, you've lived it in community so that it, that script has expanded, that story of God has expanded in our understanding. When we love God through worship and rehearse together, it is going out and saying, yes, yes, God. So you, you, mm-hmm. you've infiltrated my life. Mm-hmm. And so now let's go, let's go do this and let's go live this story out loud. Let's go lead my life with this story. And, and it is intimidating, but I, I'm hoping people will take ownership of it um, and ownership of that God has this incredible story for us to tell together with God and that doing it together, it, it's, it's leading St. Luke's story out in the world too. Well, let me say like, it is a super fun adventure. Like in a million years, yes. if you would have said, Angie, you're going to open up a yoga studio. <laughs> you know, it doesn't make sense, but how much fun it has been 
especially doing it with community and finding myself in places I would have never, ever thought where right. God has said, yes, you need to be here and I can use you here. So I think it's, I said intimidating, but it is, I wouldn't change it for anything. It has been a blast and very difficult all at the same time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. For those that I've met in my volunteer uh, capacity doing you know, the multitude of things we've talked about. I always tease and I say, whatever you do, please don't fire me because this is the best paycheck (laughs) I've ever received. I love that. I love that. So I'm excited because I think this podcast will make people think differently about how God is using them um, and how God is, you know, we, I've grown up in a seminary area, era, era, where people have told us as preachers, you are the primary theologian of your church. You are the one to hold the way people read scripture and hold the way people talk about God and hold the vision. And in in my studies over the last few years, I'm like, no, our job is that you all, you all are the public theologians. You are the primary theologians. You go tell the story. You're out in the community and you are the witnesses. I mean, that's the scripture is Jesus says, you will be my witnesses to the disciples in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And that's you. That's you all living in your ordinary lives, doing whatever it is that you do and living the story out loud. So thank you for being examples of that for St. Lucas, um, for me. Um, and thank you for the beautiful way that you care um, for your lives and the story that God has given you to lead. So we hope all of you will do the same. Um, consider the ways that God has given you to lead and live the story out loud. And we'll see you next week.